Well, we've got a grand sight here. We're, we're on the pierhead in the Danish harbour of Farberg, where, oddly enough, the boat that I was on when I met my wife, Roz, in 1969 was built back in, I think, the 1920s. And she was not unlike the boats that we're seeing out here. The little one coming in here is a, is a trader of some sort. I don't know what her provenance is. But it's interesting seeing all the different sorts of boat, really. We've got a catch here. And she's still got her sails up. I'm interested to see when she's going to drop them because she's not going to sail into the harbour, I don't think. But what's really great is to see the, the boat with the square topsails out here. She's a topsail schooner and absolute proper job. She's lowering her, I guess, an upper topsail yard now uh, to skill the wind from the sail. And that's the way it was always done. Sail is sheeted out first, and then the yard is hoisted to flatten the sail and give her the uh, give her the drive she needs. And the drive out of those two square topsails is quite frankly amazing. You wouldn't think they'd be that good because they haven't got that much area, but there's something about them that really brings a schooner to life. And that is a topsail schooner, which I'm going to talk about in a minute because there's all sorts of nonsense talked about what sort of boat is what. There's a lot of ignorance now. Oh look now, see what's happening to the to the to the actual topsail. Uh, it's being clued up <coughs> slowly. The lads on deck are pulling up the corners of the sail. There it goes, because that yard doesn't move. That one's stationary. They're cluing it up, and the bottom of the sail will be pulled up with bunklings. And in a minute, it'll be up on the yard, and it won't be drawing at all. It'll just be a bunch of canvas. And in due course. The guys on board will go up there and, and stow it tidily. Now see what's happened to the upper topsail. It's being snuffed in by the buntlings. Those are lines that go under the bottom of the sail and up to the yard. And it's all done from the deck. Nobody has to go up there. They're heaving away on the deck to do it. And they're just going to do the topsail as well, I would imagine. Or maybe they won't. Maybe it's dead now. It's done. The foresail's down. Still in a heap on the deck. And they've got to do the main. And my goodness me. Here comes the vessel that I don't know about, I'm ashamed to say, but it's lovely to see the details of the rig there. All the, the blocks that are used for pulling up the gaff, throat halyard block, with a nice little slider on it so it can move into the right place as the gaff changes angle. Fine young man on the helm there. Great to see these young people involved with these boats. Good morning. It's early and we're in Farberg in southern Denmark on the island of Foon and behind me is probably as good a collection of ex-working vessels that you'll ever see on planet Earth. The Danes just do this so well and these boats are a particular personal interest to me because many of them are Baltic traders. These are the small ships that plied the ordinary working trade of the southern Baltic in the years from the year dot probably until I think the early 1960s because in the very late 1960s as a very young man indeed I served as a deckhand on one of these she'd been bought out of trading uh, in the middle 60s and she ended up in England and she was in a terrible state when I joined her and I'm not going to tell you the whole story suffice it to say that when I was on board I learned a lot of my trade and I met my wife who is behind the camera now uh, with aching arms and uh, doing a great job. And all those years ago, on one of these vessels, we got together. So they're particular personal interest to me. Uh, the ones without any square yards are called galleasses. And they are generally either catches or schooners. Uh, behind me there are some with square yards and those are mostly topsail schooners. Now you probably think I'm talking double Dutch here. What do all these things mean? Well, you know, I get slightly disappointed when I'm teaching Yachtmaster instructors because very often I'll just ask them who knows the difference between a brig and a brigantine and you know nobody ever does well when I was a young man I was thirsty for knowledge about this sort of thing and, um, and I still am I'm still loading up on information all the time I love modern yachts I've got one I sail it I've sailed halfway around the world and back in modern yachts but I also adore these traditional boats because they've got so much to tell us and they are after all where we've come from and if we don't know where we've come from how can we possibly imagine that we know where we're going to so let's look at a few details should we and see why there's such a turn on 
here's a piece that's quite educational. We're looking at the, the bow of the galleass here. Uh, she's got a beautifully stowed staysail. Well done, lads. Nice job. But what I really want to look at is the way the forestay is seized to attach to the bottle screw. Now, you see, the natural thing to do here, what you'd imagine people would do, would be to splice it back. You can see the bottle screw running down to the, to the Samson post. Well, there's something interesting to start with. Why is it there? Why is the bottle screw not on the bottom of the forestay? Well, the answer to that is that if it was at the bottom of the forestay, you wouldn't be able to get the staysail right down because this bottle screw would get in the way. So what they do, they've taken it round a sheave which is on the top of that spectacle iron there, which is all the gammoning, whatever it is, that is holding the, the bowsprit. And they run it in and then make it up on the, on the Samson post. Now, rather than splicing it, what they've done, they've turned and seized it. So the wire comes round the thimble, which you see in the bottle screw, painted black, and it comes back against itself and it's nipped together with those seizings. Those are racking seizings. That's a particular type of seizing that can take, as, uh, that can take an off-centre pull so that as the forestay pulls they don't just collapse and go all, all, all haywire. Um, the reason for doing it is that if you splice a wire you disturb it. You disturb its galvanising and it'll go rusty and then before you know where you are it'll break. So what you do instead, you turn it and you seize it. And that way you get just as strong a result, but you are not disturbing the galvanizing in the wire. And so it lasts. Isn't that great? And if you look now at the shrouds, you'll see that the same thing is done there. And it's always done at the bottom end because the bottom end of the shroud and the forestay is where the salt water gets. Most of these boats have got top masts. A top mast is basically a little mast which is slung up above the main part of the spar and they're doubled and where they come together it's called doublings. There are two irons up there. There's a, there's a thing called a spectacle iron at the top of the, of, of the lower mast and you can see the top mast passing through it just above the light there. The lower part of the mast rests on that platform which is called trestle trees. It's located in that square hole you can see and there will be a fid that is a big heavy bar of iron which is pushed through the top mast to stop it coming down. To get the top mast up there it's literally hoisted. Um, all the rigging's let off slack and you pull it up with a halyard and up it goes, the fid goes in and you set up the rigging and there you go and you can set sails off that uh, and they will bring the boat to life. And all traditional boats have this arrangement. Square riggers have two or three of them. But uh, the schooner, like this one, has just got two top masts, and that's a lovely example. can see here is the top mast being used thoroughly by having square topsails. These are square sails which are set from the top mast of this topsail schooner. It's the square sails that make her into a topsail schooner, not the fact that she says she sets gaff topsails. Uh, there's a lot of nonsense talked in uh, circles nowadays selling schooners. People say oh it's a gaff topsail schooner. That means absolutely nothing at all. Any gaff rig vessel worth her salt will set a topsail. Uh, so you would assume that she would set gaff topsails. Um, the interesting thing is if she sets square topsails and that's what makes her into a topsail schooner. What we're seeing here is two yards very close together at the top. Um, the lower yard doesn't move and the upper yard is hoisted to the top of the rig. The sail is sheeted out to the lower yard 
uh, it's let go from its gaskets obviously so that it can set and the halyards then pull the yard up hence hall yard the name of the halyard and when it's up it stretches out the sail and it sets and pulls like a horse this boat carries two square topsails um, the lower topsail is sheeted out to the spar that you can see which is actually set on the main mast below the doublings for the top mast that's simply there to sheet the lower topsail or which is actually the topsail the one at the top would be called the upper topsail so there it is so that's your topsail schooner well this is a fine looking bowsprit it's of great interest because it's a single spar and very often when the spar gets to be that length it's doubled with a sort of topmast just like we were describing when we were talking about topmast but it's called a jib boom as in jib boom and we haven't got one here we've just got a single spar which is very strong and it's well rigged um, it's rigged from underneath which is where the big pull comes with bob stays which is what these chains are the two chains that you could see going up they stop the upward pull of the head sails they allow the boys and girls to get the halyards tight and get a tight jib luff because as we all know without a tight jib luff you might as well stop trying to sail to windward everything is vanity without a tight jib luff and those bob stays really do it underneath the bowsprit uh, they've got some netting rigged which is actually very important very, when these boats were working they probably didn't have that but there's a world of difference between somebody who was born and raised to whip down a bowsprit and somebody who's only doing it at the weekend so they're very useful they're also useful because they contain the sails when they come down and without the netting uh, the sails can go everywhere so so as you see they're using the netting to to stow the sails they're also great because they can uh, stop people falling in the water which is what you really want I made the netting under the under the bowsprit on the Baltic trader back in 1969 well you've really got to hand it to the Danes haven't you these are not just museum pieces these are all working vessels they go to sea and they actually get out there and do it in most of the weather that God sends so they're a bit of an inspiration to us all I've loved coming down here this morning and sharing a little bit of it with you. I'm sorry we haven't got time for more, but it's a great thing to do. I'm going back to my old yacht now. <laughs> Kissing me yesterday's goodbye for the time being, but the memory never dies. <laughs>